Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Thanks for joining me. Hope you're having a good week. Spring. Well, actually, technically, I guess we are into summer now. So whatever season it is, I hope it's, it's training season, isn't it? Hope it's going well for you. We're going to talk a lot about that, among other things. We've got a rare combination as our guest today. A pro trainer. You've read about him in any number of magazines. And he's also a hunting guide. So whether you're looking for advice on getting your dog into shape or you're looking for advice on how to hunt better, Ethan Pippett with Standing Stone Kennels will have some advice for you. I'll also talk to you about what you're doing with your dogs in the last few weekends, and we'll cover some public ground for rough grouse way up in the Northeast Kingdom. Get your notebooks handy, and get ready to learn and have a little fun at the same time. Speaking of learning and having fun, congratulations everybody at the Central Oregon NAVDA chapter. And thank you judges, great showing. Lots of our friends out there and uh, uh, some great scores. So congratulations, everybody. You know, on any given day, any dog can do well or do not so well. And so while it is just a snapshot, it is good to see dogs that score well. And uh, it's a reflection on, on both the dog and the human. Over here, my weekend and everything else I'm doing, um, crazy, but good. We're making progress. Finally figured out uh, that we need to go back a couple steps on uh, on birds that walk around in front of Flick. So I've um, I've uh, gotten to the yard again to to work on that sort of thing, using variations on the belly band, the gut hitch, uh, the half hitch, depending on whose philosophy you follow all of those things. But whatever they are, they seem to work pretty well. It's just a matter of repetition, and I mean lots of repetition but you know all about that because i asked on our facebook pages what have you been doing with your dog lately (laughs) brett cochran says a weekend of rafting with the pup he's got his own brand new shiny bright orange life vest there nick spurlock says huckleberry got his first point on a wild bird a mountain quail the little guy's 15 weeks old he pointed three different coveys nick says Holding steady, that's another story. Derek Moore, a man after my own heart. Rue needed a good brushing, had a lot of dubbing for tying flies. (laughs) There's the prize for the best comment on the post so far. Brad Fleming is working on duck searches with Bertel von Flusterhum. Flusterhum? I think I got it sort of right. Dave DeSmither, I feel your pain, drove for four hours, sweltered in the sun and heat for three hours, then drove home four hours. Sounds like a hunt test or a field trial to me. Uh, Matt Templeton, water retrieves in the pool. Now that's the life. I love it. Mike and Erica Carter says uh, their dogs mainly panted all, all weekend. And George Cummins, out on the water again. You are one lucky guy. Lots of water work going on. Actually, Amundsen Norwegian Flash Joel is working in water as well. So is Mike Sims. Yeah, not a bad idea. Keep up the good work, everybody. Just keep doing something with your dogs, uh, whether it's retrieves like Mike Weiss or place training uh, like uh, Rick Calabro. Uh, Great to see all the photos. Feel free to post them anytime and uh, share with us all the things that you're doing. You know, if nothing else, it provides everybody with a little bit of uh, inspiration, motivation, whatever you want to call it. It's all useful all the time. And it's always fun to look at puppies, isn't it? So the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products crafted at the highest caliber. Looking forward to having Fred Bohm at Sage and Breaker on the podcast very soon. We're going to learn a lot about how to clean guns, among other things. Right now, if you're looking at uh, your Remington 870 and wondering what to do with it, 
They've got a new video at sageandbreaker.com on cleaning a Remington 870. Who doesn't have one of them? Probably the first gun for a lot of us. And while you're there, get on the mailing list. You'll have first shot at all the new gear. Did you get your Father's Day bundle from Sage and Breaker? Not too late. I bet they can accommodate you even now. And hunt HuronSD.com. Huron, South Dakota, my favorite South Dakota destination. They got more pheasants than people. 142,000 acres of public access, plus all the services, all the comforts of home. It's all at HuntHuronSD.com. Looking forward to this one so that we can talk Kansas and South Dakota, dogs and bird hunting. Joining me at the Upland Nation podcast is Ethan Pippett. You've seen him written up in several magazines recently. His operation is called Standing Stone Kennels. I'll let him explain that, among other things. Ethan, welcome to the podcast. Well, hey, thanks for having me. Let's start with that, because I I was thinking about that earlier today when I was running my dog, and I think I know what a standing stone is. I think I've almost knocked over a couple, but uh, let's go way back and talk about the operation. Tell me the backstory there. Uh, Well, I was... uh... Born, raised, bird dog guy. From the little, littlest as I could be, it was drug along, chasing bird dogs, uh, you know, and even at one point in time was the bird dog, you know. It's uh, <laughs> kind of a, no, I'm just teasing you. To be completely honest with you, I think that's the story that most people expect to hear. Um, I think that's the most, the, the story that most people expect to hear. I, in fact, was different than that and probably more, mm, in, in fact, the exact opposite, and, and more relatable to the average person that's probably listening. It's uh, I was a athlete in college, blew out my knee, became a computer nerd, worked my way through college fixing computers, and decided I wanted to get into hunting at that level of my life. I had very small exposure as a young individual, kind of had a, a interest-ish, but no one really closely involved and you know i kind of took it upon myself as a approaching full adult if you will that it was something i wanted to get into and most things that i like to do i dive head first so well um some of us have yet to become full adults but uh but i won't hold that (laughs) against you (laughs) that's that's part of the joy of working with dogs all the day all day long i think so um so just out of curiosity, um, base, baseball or football, do the, do the number on your knee? Ah, uh, man, football. Uh, <laughs> ACL, MCL, LCL, and uh, medial meniscus. Oh, yeah, boy. Oh, it. boy. And I thought I was bad off. <laughs> well, it doesn't bother me today, but I'm yeah. sure it will soon. <laughs> um, hey, listen, yeah, <laughs> they've got, they've got uh, replacements now that are – pretty easy to put in you can almost do it yourself that's what i've heard i'm not looking forward to it but i am excited about the advancements. So. well that's just great so so what what was the uh, what was a real key i mean did you have a revelation was there an epiphany that uh, that that finally hit you and and you said yeah this is pretty cool i think i'll do this now well you know i <laughs> My wife's family um, did a little bit more hunting, and I had an uncle that did some hunting, but I didn't get to go. It just was one of those things that they lived a long ways away, and it just didn't happen. You know, those, it wasn't my dad's thing. It wasn't my family's thing, so getting to take those trips didn't really happen as much, and when I had my own vehicle and had my own time, you know, I kind of was able to take it more that direction, got a little more involved with my wife, and then it's like, man, I really want one of these dogs. And, you know, you just find a dog, right? And you put enough time in and they become perfect. That was the idea that I had in my head. And uh, so I tried that. <laughs> um, I found out that was not exactly how it works. Yeah, I could have t- told you that. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got a puppy out of the paper. My wife and I did. And... I started training and realized that I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And 
I went to like the age bracket, if you will, that I am. I went to the internet and then I looked for videos and I read books and I read articles and, um, you know, there's some information out there that was a little better than others, but, um, I think a majority of the stuff that I was watching were actually VHS tapes that were converted to DVD, which just puts into perspective, you know, how long ago they were actually created, which um, there wasn't a whole lot in that specific time frame as far as new, fresh information out there. You know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but it's still true to a great degree. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of production value, but there's not a whole bunch of informational value in some of those. Yeah, it's true. Now, the one thing I will say is I've found you can learn something from all of them and trying to be an optimist about a majority of things in life. And now that learn something may not necessarily be something to do, but it may be just, you know, even, and I, I kind of realized this when, I started having some folks that are, you know, now working for us and different things watch some of these videos. And I was like, hey, I want you to take a look at this one. And they're like, wow, that literally looks different than the way that we do that. And I'm like, well, what are you seeing? You know, just kind of talk me through it. And starting, they were able to pick out body language and dog language and body and handler dog interaction that, um, you know, I was impressed that they were able to see those things. But that was the kind of stuff that they were learning. So whether it was, something you can actually pull from a training standpoint, it was, there's definitely things to pull there. So um, I'm with you. <laughs> there's a lot of production value that goes into those, but there's always, you can always learn from something. You can always you know, learn something. You're absolutely right. And I, I tell people the same thing, go to a seminar. And if you get one little tiny kernel of information, it was worth whatever the hundred bucks was or whatever. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned body language and I want to talk about that because everybody's got their own take on this, but it seems to be a common denominator, great dog trainers. Um, there's, they see things that most of us don't take the trouble to see. And then they think about those things a little differently. I mean, are you, are you, do you would you agree with that? Oh, 100%, 100%. So one of the things that we have now, as we've grown our business and everything else, we've got a lot of folks that reach out to us and ask questions, you know, and so one of my number one answers is, man, I really got to see what's going on to be able to decipher what you're trying to explain to me is happening because you're saying you've got an aggressive nine week old puppy. And I'm saying that doesn't happen very often. So what is this aggression? What are we actually looking at? And being able to read body language of the dog and is the way that the individual is interacting with them tells the story a lot better than, you know, maybe you or I, or even them in that situation can explain. Uh, let's go down the puppy path for a little bit because number one, it's fun. And number two, it's a part of your business. And number three, so many people still think that uh, they can leave a dog alone until he's a year old, then they can start the training process. What's your philosophy on all of that? Man, as soon as they as soon as they come out, we start training them, and that is that that starts from a breeding standpoint. Um, we go through a process. It's called biosensor training. It's a program developed by the military. Have you heard of this at all? I, I think I have, probably, but from another name as well. So explain. Super please. dog training. Yes. Yeah. So essentially, um, you're going to help put the dog through minor amounts of stresses. And I'm talking very minor, but minor amounts of stresses to kind of help their body um, to develop, to be stronger. So when if you think about what a puppy does to begin with, they crawl around on their belly, maybe occasionally get rolled over, but for the most part, they're laying flat on their stomach. Um, in this super dog training, it sounds more advanced than it is, biosensor than it is, but basically you're helping to you roll the puppy onto their back for just a few seconds. You stand them with their head erect. You tip them upside down, all for just a few seconds. So we're essentially forcing this blood around their body at an earlier age than what it would normally, which is going to help to build a stronger uh, immune system, cardiovascular system, and ultimately a puppy that's more prepared for life. 
Now, you you talk about it as if all it's about is biology, but all of those things you've described are also going to make a dog a little bit more resilient emotionally, aren't they? Uh, yeah, I definitely believe there's part of that in it. Um, you know, how much exactly at that point in their life is is geared toward that, I don't I don't have the stats on it, but I know it can't hurt, so... Well, you know, I thought you were going to go further towards the, oh, we make them eat out of seven different bowls and they walk on seven different floor types, et cetera. Do you do any of that uh, more, I don't know what to call it, more uh, adaptive Environmental enrichment. There, thank you. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why you're a highly paid dog trainer and I'm just a schmo <laughs> with a microphone. <laughs> Oh, highly paid is probably not quite the accurate uh, statement there, but dog trainer I am referred to as. So when we do that, yes. It, as far as a specific structured program with that, when it comes to that, no. It's more um, for us, we, we try and take the philosophy to introducing all of the things that we're going to kind of expect out of them as adults. Now, that being said, you have to have – you know, a realistic outlook on that, right? So we can't say, all right, I, at some point in time, I'm going to ask you to fetch ducks out of the river. So go, puppy. Um, but, you know, being able to bring them into new environments, allow them to explore them, and then the number one thing I think that goes hand in hand with all of this, because you are going to see some level of apprehension at some point in time, you're going to see some dogs excel, some dogs need a little bit of encouragement, but coddling is the number one thing that we don't do. If the puppy seems apprehensive, we don't say, oh, it's okay, puppy. We say, come on, you can do this, let's go. You know, it's encouragement, but then almost in a sense, borderline of tough love. We're not, we're not gonna coddle that behavior because the communication is very similar to the same type of communication that we have with positive reinforcement oh good dog oh good job that's awesome that communication comes off the same and then we're essentially praising or rewarding the behavior of being apprehensive and so with all of those new environments i don't have a set like you walk across sandpaper and then sand and then uh, gravel and then grass but we do introduce them to all of those things textures and grasses and different places and all of that stuff but we just take an approach of you know be bold and confident and if you aren't we're going to encourage you to be so not coddle you for not being so so you get a lot of questions from uh from folks who um maybe are less less experienced as dog trainers what are, what are some of the more pop popular, popular? Yeah. common what are some of the more common questions you get oh i would say Crate training, potty training questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then puppy biting. Yeah. From there, it goes straight into some level of what is the specific path and direction that I should be going with my dog. And that's kind of a more broad one, but it's a pretty commonly asked question. Yeah, you could be talking. We could do three podcasts on that. <laughs> this is true this uh, is true how do you answer somebody like that just because i'm curious now uh you know wh what what is the direction you'll give those people um so to start with with the the potty training or crate training aspect of things we have a whole list of stuff and you know for us we actually have a youtube channel that we create dog training videos and this is basically to fill what I felt like was a void in our specific niche um, when I started. You know, there wasn't fresh new content. And then when you found content, it was like you were talking with that high production value where it seemed like they took a finished dog and demonstrated a behavior as opposed to showing you the process that goes into teaching, um, which doesn't always go as planned. So we created a bunch of videos that are more of a one take type thing to show the teaching process and how we work through multiple different dogs and their struggles and their successes and what that looks like. So 
in when I answer those questions all the times I refer to some of those videos where we've done 24 hours in the the day of a life of a puppy here and the first night and how we and potty training where we actually took a puppy and showed that process of at night what we did and the first night we got up five times and the second night we got up three times and the third night we got up two or three times and then it was you know we had a successful sleep all night because we took all these steps so we refer to those things but it's basically uh, setting the puppy up for success by having good amounts of exercise mental and physical stimulation and then there involves uh, a little bit of setting them down the path of the things that you want to see out of them as adults so we expect our dogs to be able to understand crate training because it's a very important part of dog development. We start that from day one. You come home, you learn this is the expectation here, not you get to sleep in bed until all of a sudden now you have to be downgraded, which is what it's viewed like for the dog. Um, so having a goal in mind with what your expectations are and then following through that from the beginning, that's a typical potty training, house training aspect of things. Um, the other side of it with house training is just the fact that, you know, puppies are little and they're babies and you have to consider them as such. It's not going to happen in a day. It's not going to happen usually in a week. Sometimes within the first couple of months, you're going to be seeing a lot better success um, if you're diligent, if you're consistent and you put the time in. You got to stay on top of them. You got to them around you have to take them outside make sure they pee bring them back inside play with them all of those things come into hand and it's a lot of work and i think bringing that realization to the surface and saying guys you know you're not alone in this it's a lot of work so what you're experiencing is normal and uh, helps people a lot it sounds like a 12-step program to me but uh, i'm okay with that <laughs> And, you know, you, you said something that reminded me, I, uh, one of my nieces married a guy who went on one duck hunt and came home and decided he wanted a poodle pointer that day. And I spent the next four weeks convincing him not to go get a bird, especially a high powered bird dog like that. Um, yeah, absolutely. because I, I knew his life and I knew that he couldn't do any of the things that you just described. I mean, do you see that a lot? Do you a see lot. people enamored with, uh, with a dog or with a, with the sport and then poof, all of a sudden they're, they're trying to be a bird dog owner, but they don't have the time nor the inclination to devote to it. You know, unfortunately, yes, unfortunately, Yes, we do. And the uh, this kind of come to, uh, I'm brutally honest comments. You ask questions, I give answers, and they're not always what people want to hear. But, um, you know, I, bird dogs and, and working breeds and things, they aren't for everybody. And, and that even goes to specific dogs within working breeds. There's sure. differences. And, you know, there there is not every dog is made for every family. But there is a family for every dog. I believe that 100%. And we take that approach to our program and try and be really upfront with people. We try and match, you know, the right family. We do have an interview process for folks just like you're talking about and say, how much do you hunt? How active are you? What are your daily routines? What do you have as a setup? Are you prepared for this higher energy, active dog that's going to need to, that's going to need that mental and physical stimulation? And you know, some people say, you know, really, I don't think I am. But for the most part, we've got pretty good plans in place. And then sometimes we still make mistakes. And, you know, the the alpha or the whatever you want to name it, the most high-powered dog ends up with the family that was looking for maybe a little lower-key puppy, you know, and there's a mistake there, right? So sure. it's, it's being able to say, hey – Let's get you the right dog and having an open mind about the fact that not every family is right for every dog, but there is a family out there that is, and we want to do what's best for the dog. So you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the humble host, and that is Ethan Pippett with Standing Stone Kennels. And the uh, web address is standingstonekennels.com, right, Ethan? 
Yeah, that's perfect. And lots of insights there. Those videos are incredible. And and, uh, and if we're going to look for you on YouTube, I imagine once we're on YouTube, we could just type in Standing Stone Kennels and find you and your lovely spouse, Kat, uh, bestowing us with all sorts of wisdom. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty cool. If you search Standing Stone Kennels and then whatever topic you're specifically wanting to mm. know about too, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it pulls you right to all of the videos about puppies or crate training or retrieving or pointing birds or any of that stuff take a look over there and in the meanwhile uh let's just cover a a lot of ground real fast so uh here are some of the questions that i hear all the time and the areas that um you know that that we both deal with uh, maybe more frequently than just somebody that has one bird dog once first is um, what should we do more of as a dog trainer uh, just in general? Um, in general, what should you do more of as a dog trainer? Yeah. Uh, praise. Be consistent. You know, okay. <laughs> there you go. Good boy. Be consistent. Okay. <laughs> All right. More kibble for you, Ethan. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, do you mean in, you know, in the words, in the training process, all of the above, is it just a lifestyle that we need to adopt? Yeah, all of it. I mean, everything that you're doing, if you, consistency. And the thing that's even more important than that would be timing. Um, those two go interchangeably. But at the same time, if your timing is off and you're consistent about it, your dog's still not going to learn properly. So mm-hmm. um, you need proper timing first and foremost, and then you need to be consistent with everything you're doing. Using words, if you need to consistently get them out and work them. You need to be consistent about your expectations. Um, all of it is consistency is going to be the key. Timing is everything. Give me an example. Um, so we utilize clicker training. Okay. Um, yeah. have you heard of that at all? Oh yeah. I'm still not convinced. So, um, after we talk about okay. the timing on it, tell me why, but start with the beginning. Yep. So clicker training for those that are listening, it's a marker. Basically, um, we have to build a clicker makes a little noise, click, and it's loud enough for the dog to hear. And we build a positive association with that noise. And then we utilize that noise to specifically, like I said, it's a marker, mark a behavior. And what that does for the dog basically is takes a, a picture, a snapshot that says right there, that moment, what you did was right. And it's amazing. The next, I mean, it works better if it started with puppies and developed on because you need a dog that has desire to work for something. So starting with a puppy, I really believe you'll be amazed if you just go, all right, I'm going to, you know, take what this guy says and try it. But, um, you, you'll see, you make that click noise, the puppy will perk up. It knows something good's coming and it. It makes it clear for them. And it's a consistent noise that is always the same. There's no inflection. There's no baggage from what you're feeling for the day. And then from the timing aspect of things, um, you need to mark the exact moment that they do whatever they're doing. If you mark wrong, you're going to be marking the wrong behavior. So timing um, falls into that category. And then as um, you know, anything else, let's say the dog makes a mistake the t- and you have to correct them at some point in time. Um, dog's attention span is somewhere in the three to five second realm for a majority of things like that. So if you're, you walk in the house and you see your puppy peed on the floor. Or you walk in the other room, you see that you can't grab the puppy, rub their nose in it because it happened who knows how long ago. All that teaches the puppy is that, you know, don't get near dad and don't smell pee because it's bad. Um, so timely, though, if you catch the puppy in the act of peeing, you can say, hey, stop that. Let's go outside and pee. And those things, those things are going to make it click a lot better for the dog. Pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah so so okay so you you hit the clicker yep and the dog's expectation early on very young puppy early on here's the clicker what's what's going to happen that's going to get him excited get him motivated so, sure so you when you build that positive association with the clicker you got to use something that the dog likes every dog needs to eat so we utilize their actual meals to train for and i'm a firm believer that our working dogs and all dogs in nature are working dogs that they are 
you know, dogs from a natural standpoint are working animals. Okay. Um, some of them further from that today than others, but a majority of the working dogs, it makes the most sense to them to have to work for their meals and dogs that have structure and have those pieces in place in their life um, are happier and overall well, better adjusted. So um, we work for meals. Food you treats. Use, uh, and, and specifically the dog kibble that they get for that meal, as opposed to a higher value, something, something that creates a precedence. Like, oh, I only work for hot dogs. Oh, um, no, you, yeah. you work for your dog food. And we have a little bit of a tough love type of mentality when it comes to it. In the beginning stages, we start with that. If you say not interested in your training session or your clicker or your food, then we skip that meal. It doesn't take more than one or two meals before the puppy's like, hey, this is important. I better pay attention. Oh, yeah, so true. If we, if we only have the intestinal fortitude to do that. So how about uh, introducing uh, a young dog to birds? How do you do it and when? Okay. Uh, it's a great point. And it's, uh, it's going to be when you're seeing boldness and confidence out of the puppy. That for some dogs may be in that eight to 10 weeks age, you can introduce a bird then. Some others may be a little slower bloomers and you got to go uh, 12 to 16 weeks or six months. Um, I like to do it sooner rather than later if we have a bold and confident puppy. Now, um, I will use live birds and there's a lot of uh, discrepancy on whether or not that is a good thing or a bad thing. But the fact of the matter is the dogs are going to experience them and I need it to provide every opportunity for them to see the things that are going to happen later in a controlled environment or as controlled so that we don't cause long-term issues. You know, if yeah. all we deal with is feathers in the yard and then a rooster jumps up in front of them in the field, that could still cause some pretty major issues. So um, with that young puppy, we typically start with a pigeon and we'll lock wings or harness the bird in a way that it can't flap around that it provides some level of sniff it check it out then we let that bird flap around if the puppy's pumped they get to chase it and that's uh that's the bird introduction yeah and and i think that the operative word in all that was controlled so that there is no you know there's no negative experience with a bird at the very beginning. That's the goal. Yeah. Yep, that's the goal. And speaking of control and introducing a puppy, what about gunfire? Gunfire is an important one, right? We we work primarily with bird dogs and gun dogs, um, and gunfire is a huge part of that. Now, I'm a, a firm believer that um, unsensitivity on average is created, and that comes from things even before the actual gunfighter induction, a dog that is bold and confident and be in their environment will have drastically less of a chance of having issues with gun sensitivity. A dog that is apprehensive about the world and then put in bad situations can have issues drastically more easily. So as far as us, once we have a solid bird introduction, we typically utilize that bird drive to essentially cloud what is happening with the gunfire so that the gunfire becomes a background noise and then eventually gets associated with this awesome thing that is birds. Um, we get a lot of questions. Can you do it without birds? Yes, but you need something that the dog is extremely high drive about because you need them focused on that. The gunfire itself becomes more of a background type of thing. You know, I hate to ask this because I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that to to make a bird dog, you need birds, <clears throat> but there are people out there who only get ex uh, their dogs only get exposure to birds at a training day every mo month or something like that. And then during the season. So yes. what else uh, could motivate a dog enough to acquaint them with gunfire in a controlled situation besides birds? Some dogs are very bumper driven. Uh -huh. um, so you could play fetch and incorporate that. I know that's, I mean, that's a lot of times what retriever guys do. They are throwing bumpers sure. and the dog loves yeah. bumpers and they can incorporate that. Um, I think that there's pretty mixed reviews as far as whether that works with 
the average bird dog or the average versatile dog. Um, they seem to be a little more bird driven depending on how they're developed and how they're bred. But if you've got a dog that you would categorize as would kill for the next bumper, then I think that that would, that would fit. If you have a dog that gets bored after one or two throws, then you're probably going to need higher value yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about, uh, I asked you what we should do more of when we're training dogs. What about the opposite? What should we probably try to do less of or avoid altogether? Hmm. Um, I have to think on that one a little bit as far as something not to do would be, and this is a cop-out answer, but don't be inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> don't have bad timing. Okay, that's um, cheating. I mean, <laughs> it is cheating. It is cheating. but I, uh, I get it. I know I do get it. How about that? So I, I mean, would say... I've got one for you, I think. I've got a, I got a really good one. I think that the average person um, overdoes stuff. I think that they overdo stuff. Yeah, and yeah. they get all wrapped up in, I've got to do all these things because they just got their new puppy and they're excited about it. And then all of a sudden you've got a 12-week-old puppy that's bored of retrieving because they've played fetch till they didn't want to do it anymore every single day since they've come home. Or they're training three training sessions a day because the more is better, right? If, if a little is good, more is better. Um, which that's, I think the, that would be the thing that it would say, don't do more of it's, um, everything in moderation. You can overdo anything and, um, taking a breath, taking a step back, letting that puppy be a puppy while still maintaining some level of exp expectation is important good friend of mine who really changed my philosophy about dog training. He said, never be a greedy owner. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. And especially if you have an audience, you got somebody in the backyard with you. Watch that's this, watch do. this, watch <laughs> this. Yeah. <clears throat> over and over until even the humans yeah. are bored stiff. Um, we're going to talk hunting next. And, and in that, a realm will also talk a little bit more about training for hunting, obviously, and, and what we're doing there. That's Ethan Pippett with Standing Stone Kennels. I'm Scott Linden, the host of the Upland Nation podcast. Ethan, take a quick break. I'll be back to you in about 90 seconds. In the meanwhile, everybody else, stick around because I want to remind you of one of my favorite spot well they're all favorites i shouldn't say it that way i like kids apparently um you can't have a favorite sponsor you love them all equally right my friends uh joe and manning exum at happy jack uh they've, they've got remedies for just about everything from skin and coat if you haven't watched the video yet go over on my youtube channel and watch it uh for pads or parasites Learn all about the solutions they have, especially this time of year if you're worried about fleas and ticks. HappyJackInc.com. You know, most of the time you don't need to go to the vet for this stuff. It's simply a matter of having the right product on hand and using it correctly. HappyJackInc.com is where you learn more about all of that stuff. And then to protect your dog on the road, I can't think of a better crate than the Roughland Performance Kennel. You might remember them as Rough Tough. I sure do. I'll never forget my first hunting trip with Doug Sangal, the owner of Roughland Kennels. We've had a great time over the years. One of the things I love most is wherever you put that kennel in your truck, the doors open both ways. So um, that does two things. Number one, it makes life a little bit more convenient for you. And then when you're cleaning that kennel, you can take the door off pretty easily and then clean it out and put that door back on. They use technology that was developed for the safety of race car drivers. They've got accessories of all sorts. I love the things that I can stack on top to hold gear and water. Learn more at Roughland Kennels. Dot com. And that's your cue, Ethan Pippett with Standing Stone Kennels. Are you with me? Oh, yeah. Good. Well, I'm learning a heck of a lot about dog training from you. And now we're going to switch gears and take that all to the field and talk about hunting. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, 
you hunt as well as, and you guide hunting as well as training. So tell me a little bit about your guide operation. Okay, so I got in based out of winter, South Dakota. Uh, this will be my 10th season up there. Goodness. Um, we hunt all wild birds. There are a few operations up there. There's some skeptics, but as far as commercial operations, uh, we hunt 100% wild birds. And the way we're able to do that is by farming for the birds. Essentially, uh, Scott, who owns property out there, has put years and years and years in habitat, and habitat is key. So we do uh, select few groups, and we have a good time we chase birds and we deal with uh, what happens with wild birds. Some days are really good. Some days we gotta, we gotta work at it a little more. Uh, yeah. You're either a chunk of coal or you're a diamond. You're absolutely right. And any given day, what do you love most about that aspect of your operation? I mean, I could talk all day about that, but you go all the way down to winter and, uh, and run other people and other people uh, admire your dogs, I'm sure. But what is it about, hunting down there that you like so much hey, it's hunting that's on un, it's unmatched by about anywhere that i've been from a pheasant standpoint and i just fell in love with the area i like taking people out i like those experiences i like working dogs i love hunting myself but the amount of experience that my dogs are able to gain up there is unmatched to anything that i could provide them as an individual so it's fun to do that. I've made a lot of really good friends um, and as well as have become bird dog clients. So now I've got their young dogs coming up and hunting and it's kind of a fun reunion every year to get these guys back up there, see their puppies, work with the dogs and, you know, and be out there doing it. You know, um, and I, you know, I've been going to South Dakota for 25 years and I've hunted virtually every style of hunting you could find there in almost every part of the country there that has birds. What, what, what is a typical hunt look like for you and your clients? We have a decent mixture. Um, we don't hunt a ton of standing crops. I know that's a pretty typical South Dakota thing. We have a fair amount of CRP, um, had a lot of shelter belts and then some adjacent smaller food plots to either the shelter belts or the CRP or that run through them. And we have bird dogs. So I like to set them up in as many environments as possible, but we typically utilize walkers and blockers, which keeps vehicles moving to the end um, and keeps us moving through on a, a more efficient pattern. Um, we have a few spots that are kind of those, Heidi holes where you get around them and it's a, a swift strategic movement of getting everyone into place. And then it all happens. And then there's other places where, you know, we've got a few hundred acres of grass here, there that you walk and you cover a little bit more and get to watch dirt bird dogs work. Well, you, you know, and, and just for the record, we, we make a distinction between uh, bird dogs, which are typically a pointing breed of one sort or another, and, and those others. Um, but in a situation like that, are you running flushers as well? I don't. I run short hairs yeah. for everything, always. And I utilize them. I mean, they become really dang versatile if you will in that respect because i utilize them to point birds mm -hmm. and then send them into flush and then they make retrieves and they kind of do you know a little bit of everything while they're out there that's got to be tough on a trainer as well as a dog that's the one thing if i was living in south dakota i, I don't think i'd own anything but cocker spaniels and labrador retrievers because those birds will drive a pointing dog nuts how do you work around that um, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of people have a similar feeling to what you just explained. I hear that a lot. Like, oh, they're so hard to, they learn it. They, they love being out there. They love working and it just takes learning. There are some that get really good at, at locking up and then keying on the fact that eh, that bird isn't there anymore and being able to manage that. And it takes a lot of handling on my part. I will say, especially with the young dogs. It's a lot of, hey, don't run that out. Hey, you need to stay close enough for the guns aspect of things. And then by the time they're up there for their second or third or fourth season, they're pretty much on auto drive and 
there it gets really fun then but it takes experience so so can you can you actually train for that with the birds yes that's it okay that's it yeah uh it's not something that can truly be simulated you can try it but there isn't anything that matches wild birds and that's the that's the number one thing that those young dogs need well, I'm doing as close as I can to that with my my pigeons right now. I described that earlier as well. You know, one of the the things that drives so many pointing dogs nuts is a bird that just walks away, or oh, yeah. or in a rooster's case, runs away really fast. So that chasing instinct is is aggravated multiple times over. Um, do you work on that at all with young dogs, or do you just cross your fingers and hope that you can keep keep an eye on them in the field when you get out to winter? So we do. We, we shot a video about this specifically. It's the three things required to take your dog hunting: That's, uh, mm. collar conditioning for recall, so the dog will come back to you. Yeah, and then a bird introduction and a gunfire introduction. Those would be the bare minimums that you need. The rest of it can be learned out there. Now, you can't expect a seasoned professional off of that. You're going to have some screw-ups, but those are the minimums. And then we move into things like teaching them to point birds or helping to bring that out in them. It's, a, it's in most of them very heavily. You just have to properly introduce them. And then we do woe training. Any of the dogs that come up with me are woe trained, and that allows me to slow them down. I can read the dog and say, all right, you're getting birdie. If they aren't in gun range and it looks like they're, you know, you've got a bird running on them, I stop them there until we're up with them and I send them on. Now, granted, you may lose a bird that they can't continue on that track, but it's part of it too. And they get better at, at finding them and pinning them down per se to where they don't end up running on. And I can tell you, I have never taught a dog how to do that, but they sure as heck figure out how. Well, you know, you you mentioned something earlier that makes that work, and that is, uh, you're not you're you're not running very often in head high corn. You can actually see the dogs most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So tell me how a typical hunt um, uh, starts for you. Have you um, have you got a place to stay? Are you going to the same land? Uh, you know, once a week or. Uh, sure. We've walk got us, a, walk a us through a day with you. Yeah, absolutely. So we have 6,800 acres there. Um, and we have everything scheduled. It's spread out and it, we can hunt the same. Um, I mean, excuse me, we can hunt four days without hitting the same piece of property. I run three day hunts. So then you're looking at approximately seven days rest on every piece before it gets touched again. Um, nice. We have a lodge right there in winter. I make a rotation and some things get shifted in that rotation based on where the actual birds are and weather and wind. And, but for the most part, once we kind of get into a rotation for proper amounts of rest, we stick with it. Um, we leave in the morning. Uh, we hunt primarily Northwest of winter. So it's usually a 15 to 25 minute drive, give or take. Um, We'll hunt for a few hours, take a short field lunch break, and then hunt until we're either done or the guys are done or the sun cuts us off, one of the one of the three. Um, it's, you know, a big part of it for us is, is safety, and it's, it's keeping guys having a good time, getting to some opportunities to shoot birds, but uh, doing it without any accidents, so... You know, one of my first hunts in South Dakota, I learned, uh, I learned for the first, and I've seen it a million times since. But being safe, of course, is uh, high on my list as well. And I, uh, I get, I'm the designated lecturer on most of our hunts. Um, I like it. But, uh, but you know, th there are things that people don't know about that they ought to to uh, to be safer in the field. Can you think of one right off that that maybe we haven't thought about yet? it's surprising to me how poor muzzle awareness is and how often people don't utilize their safeties properly. Mm -hmm. So they're swinging guns around all over the place, not thinking about the fact that, you know, stuff comes out the end of those. And then they usually are walking, not usually, but it happens often enough that they're walking through the field without their safety on, yeah. which 
you may hit a corn stalk if we're in that edge of that food plot, or you may hit a branch in one of those shelter belts and your gun goes off. So it's, um, those are two things that I see pretty regularly. The other is just not being aware, not paying attention, not talking, not saying, not that, you know, people get hung up on talking and it's scaring birds, which there's a lot of truth to that. But still at the same time, I'd rather scare a few birds and people know where they're at. So um, it's just communicating and keeping your head kind of on a swivel to know that you're in the line properly and you know where stuff is at. And if you don't, don't take the shot. There's no pheasant out there worth it. So, uh, What about one bit of strategy or one thing that we could do um, with our skills or abilities that would make us a better hunter beyond safety, of course, but what is the one thing we could do more of or practice or be better at? Hmm. Um, I think shooting is important. <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, some people that are avid hunters are, are pretty good shots. I think that uh, guys that get to do it on the weekend need to do a little more warming up before they come. So they're, they're familiar with what's going on yeah uh well you, you can hit what you're aiming at uh, you have a higher percentage of killing birds and taking them home what position did you play in football yeah full back okay so you, you know you you were running the tires and uh and you were uh doing you know, a lot of practice uh, of handoffs and all of that yeah um would you agree with my assessment that most people don't practice shooting they just think they're they're pretty good at it because they were born in America. Well, that or they don't practice, you know, they go to a range and they stand there with their shotgun mounted to their shoulder and they call pole and then they know where the bird's flying and they break it. And they think that's, you know, sure. which, which that is a skill set in itself. It's, but it's a totally different skill set. So, set up like we kind of do for the puppies, which is preparing them for the things that they're going to be able to do, you know, prepare for that. Try and stand there at the place and then mount your gun after you call pull. That provides a new level of getting comfortable mounting and pointing. Um, but set up more realistic type of environment. Very uh, insightful and absolutely right on. Uh, by the way, everybody, I am sticking to my promise. I've been shooting every week. Can't get enough ammo to shoot my 100 rounds a week, but I'm shooting at least 50, and it's working. So, um, you know, hey, I encourage everybody who can find ammo to get out and practice more. Um, hey, let's switch gears just a little bit, Ethan, because you're on top of this stuff, and many of us aren't. Have you heard any talk about the bird numbers in South Dakota for this season? Well, I know from the locals in that South Central area that thus far they have had uh, they had a mild winter mm -hmm. and they had a, a decent amount of rain to begin with, then turned off dry, but then um, have got some more rain since a lot of stuff was planted. So kind of headed in the right direction. This spring, I heard really good reports of a lot of carryover birds. Now, as long as we have good nesting conditions, I, I feel it's favorable to have a, a really good year. So. I've, I've never asked anybody else about this, but I was, I was kind of shocked. I, you know, I work with the state of South Dakota, among others, on various things. And uh, I wasn't surprised, but I thought it was a bold move for them to stop publishing their bird population forecasts in the, in the spring and the summer. You heard any feedback from anybody else about that sort of thing, or does it really matter? Well, I think that um, I think that it could probably help them as much as it could hurt them, and would, I'm guessing that's the, the reason they took that direction. You know, if it's bad reports, people yeah. don't want to make the trip. If there's good reports, more people want to make the trip. Um, and where we've we've had a few rougher years where stuff showing decline, decline, or lower than expected, um, you know, and that turns people off. So tourism is a huge part of South Dakota, and them having a way to turn people away is not uh, good for business, um, if you will. 
I agree. Um, I, uh, I, I knew exactly how that was rationalized within the tourism department. Absolutely. So I'm glad to hear that the numbers are looking good so far and we'll keep our fingers crossed because I'm finally going to get back everybody. So, uh, two years away, I'm finally going to make it back to South Dakota this year. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to it. And maybe you have to, uh, the, the only other time I've been a winner was to have coffee with a fan of the show. So maybe we'll do that sometime. Um, if you were going to leave us with any last bit of hunting advice, Ethan Pippet of standing stone kennels and professional guide, what would you tell us? You got to put in the time. I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. And I think that it's, it's one of those things that, Knocking on doors is still a thing. Asking, talking to people, being respectful, being polite can get you a lot of uh, good opportunities to hunt. And I wouldn't be afraid to do those things. I hear a lot that, you know, where can I find public ground? Well, there's also private ground if you're a respectful individual. A lot of folks are open to that. So, Well, there you go. The good old days are today sometimes uh and i think the operative word there was respectful good on you uh learn more about ethan and cat his lovely spouse and their knowledge and their abilities at standingstonekennels.com also same thing at youtube watch some of those videos they're they're insightful they're useful and they're eye-opening as well ethan thanks for being a part of the upland nation podcast hey thanks for having me I've got a public access suggestion for you coming up on the Upland Nation podcast. First off, though, let let me remind you that the podcast is brought to you in part by Dr. Tim's premium all-natural pet foods, performance-oriented pet foods, extremely high-fat diets, all their formulations generally higher than most of the average dog foods out there for a lot of good reasons and we've talked about those and in fact there's another great video out on the youtube channel about that right now if you haven't seen it on facebook yet just check it out at my youtube channel but the whole point is if you're going to put that much fat into a dog food kibble you got to make sure that it doesn't go bad you do that with preservatives but in dr tim's case you use all natural preservatives tocopherols are the fancy highfalutin term for that stuff. It's usually a vitamin A combination, a special blend and application of mixed natural tocopherols and vitamins. No artificial preservatives used in Dr. Tim's foods, as always. Get a 30% discount on your first order. Just use the code Upland Nation. This land is your land, even up in the Northeast Kingdom. Let's take a look at a public access spot in Vermont. State has figured out that grouse hunting is a pretty cool thing, and many people would love to visit that state, or many residents would love to have access to some public access properties. Some of the best spots are the Green Mountain National Forest and state-owned ground in Essex county the bonus out there especially in october you might find a woodcock or two they're passing through some of that country is kind of a double threat if you'd like to learn more go to vtfishandwildlife.com they'll point you in the right direction not going to give you the latitude and longitude but they're going to show you where to start your own search. Well, thank you so much for your kind attention. We're brought to you in part by findbirdhuntingspots.com. New material every week to help you find places to hunt and some training and dog care advice as well. Recently, it talked about three cheapskate tips so that you can unvet your dog, you know, kind of do it yourself stuff. It's all at findbirdhuntingspots.com. Hey, if you liked what you heard, please tell a friend. That's how we grow around here, one person at a time. If you're so inclined, a favorable review or a rating 
at Apple Podcasts would be appreciated. If you want to talk about anything you hear or something you think everybody would like to hear, go to the Wing Shooting USA or Upland Nation Facebook pages. We're talking every day over there, sharing photos and great stories. Thank you to all our sponsors. Thanks, Ethan Pippett at Standing Stone Kennels. Thanks to everybody who contributed this week on the Facebook page. I'll leave you with this quote from John Grogan. He says, dogs are great. Bad dogs, if you can really call them that, are perhaps the greatest of them all. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening. See you in the field.